The thing that is seductive about games is the worlds that are built just for you. At their core, games are just rule sets. What I do as a game designer is I set you an objective and then I make it interestingly hard for you to achieve that objective. A game isn't a game if there's just a button or a win that you can just press to win. When I describe that framework, it kind of doesn't sound like much fun. And in life, it often isn't much fun. In life, we're constantly grappling with objectives that we're trying to achieve that are hard. And it's not fun, it's not seductive, it's tiring and frustrating and demoralizing. Games offer a place where the, the world works the way your mum always told you the world was gonna work. That if, you, that if you try hard, if you practice, if you don't give up, you will ultimately be successful. Even when you fail, even when you're struggling in a good game, you're learning a colossal amount about what didn't work and, and what did work. That's radically different than that faced in any other storytelling medium. You can't fail at a book. There is no point in a movie where the screen goes black and a finger points at me and says, you lose. I expose a bit of myself in playing a game that I don't in any other way. I set myself up to fail. And by choosing to do that, I give the game the capacity to give me something else back, which is to treasure every one of those failures, to help me through them towards an eventual victory. And when your story is plugged into that framework, something extraordinarily powerful can happen. Games are made of technology. It's one of the fascinating things about them. And that means that they're, they also inherit any of the limitations of that technology. In the early days, when they were trying to tell stories with believable characters, there were limits to what they could do. There was a limit to the number of colours you could get on screen at one time. There was a huge limit to the, the, the number of sprites, the number of frames of animation that you could put in. Storage was a, was a really critical issue. If you go right back to in the early 1960s, what you find is what's broadly recognised as the, the first video game, which uh, was a game called Space War, that's a space war exclamation mark. It was a game made really as an experiment on, on uh, a gigantic PDP-1 computer, which is sort of the size of a closet. What strikes you when you look back at that game is, is, is two things. The first is how stark it is, how bare it is. You, you, you have these very abstract polygons, very little visual detail, and you have this title, Space War. Those two words were crucial for helping people make sense of it. A tiny fragment of story that, that, that gave people their bearings. So even from that very, very earliest day, there's, there's been a hint of the value of, of bringing stories and games together. Working within this very limited palette, games were still reaching to tell bigger, more complicated stories. And one of the things they, they reached for, ironically enough, was, was the book. So if you look at a game like Midwinter, when you opened the box, there was a big, fat thing that we often called the manual, but was effectively the story that I was about to play. You play the police officer who becomes aware uh, on the day that the game starts that there is an invasion force massing. The game is about action and decisions, but the book is what gives you the, the, the context and the narrative of a post-dramatic climate change world. And I think that's a marvellous solution. It's a huge advantage when we can bring those two kinds of storytelling together. We're in a very different world now from that world in 1962. Absolutely across the board, those technical constraints have gone in terms of visual presentation and performance and, and it, AI and, and scripting. And we should therefore have emerged into this brave new world where everything is possible. But story is incredibly hard, it's incredibly fragile, whether you're writing a novel or a, or a film script or a, a game script. Shall we play a game? Oh. The good book story <laughs> is not necessarily a good game story. Game stories face this challenge that they have to leave space for their players. It, it's sometimes useful as a game designer to think about it in the, in the way that we mean it 
when we talk about a, a gear stick or a bit of machinery, that there's a bit of play in the system, there's a bit of space, there's a bit of room to wiggle. Games have to have a hollowness in them that the player can fill and populate. And that often means that on the surface they look like simpler, plainer stories than the ones that you find in books or film. A very good example of that is, is um, a game by Jason Rohrer called Passage. You have a, a tiny emblematic figure of a man and all you can do in that game is walk from left to right. You encounter another tiny blocky character on the way, you walk all the way to the right of the screen, the character that you meet dies, you can't tell why, you go a little further and then the character that you're controlling dies, you don't know why. Nothing seems to happen. There's just something about it though that lets you know you've missed something. And so you go back. And this time as you walk along from left to right, you notice that your tiny emblematic character is changing as you walk, is gradually going gray. And you start to understand that the character that he meets, the character that he falls in love with, is effectively a spouse. And then you start to feel a bit differently about her death at the end. And then, in a moment, still one of the kind of biggest gaming revelation moments I've ever had, you realise that although everything about how this thing is presented is designed to make you think that you can only go from left to right, you can go down. There's a down. No other medium can give you that moment of discovery. But you're still ageing. The, the time is still running out. When you understand what's being replicated here, the moment when your spouse dies, the first time that happened to me, I couldn't walk away. Walking away from that little headstone felt like a terrible thing to do, except if you don't, nothing happens. It's a crystallization of um, some incredibly substantial and significant uh, comments on, on how we live our lives. If writing a story with one resonant ending is incredibly difficult, writing one with, with a hundred or a thousand is, is next to impossible. The extra challenge in games is that when you do find that wonderful, rare, fragile, precious thread, you're opening it up to the actions of a hundred thousand players, you know, 10 million players who are going to come in with hobnailed boots and do what games encourage them to do, which is pick at the seams and poke at the corners and, and, and try to subvert the system and find a, a way around it. And the other very inescapable problem is that although the technical constraints have lifted and I, from that perspective, if I wanted, could go out and start a game tomorrow that had full performance capture for every character in it and full vocal recording and a hundred endings and incredible animation and lighting design. I would need hundreds of millions of dollars to produce all of that. I think you'd be forgiven to feel that gaming has maybe gone as far as it can in, in chasing story, that, that maybe games simply aren't very fertile territory to tell interesting stories in. But I think that's to overlook two incredibly potent tools that games have at their disposal. What we've seen in the last decade or so is that games are moving beyond the screen. We now live in a world where most of us have one computer in our back pocket and, and two in our backpacks without even thinking about it. And that means games can, can break free of the screen and go out into the world. If I want to build an extraordinary game level with fantastical buildings and twisting mysterious alleyways to explore and full of life and NPCs running around living out their daily lives. I don't need to build any of that. I just need to set my game in the old town of Edinburgh and, and have my players come there and experience all of that for real. It's impossible to overstate how big a shift that is of, of how many possibilities that opens up when we're able to cross-pollinate games with the world around us without losing any of the, the technological complexity and, and enhancement that, that we're used to. The second element that, that I think never gets talked about enough in games is games don't exist. I can't make a game until you show up to play it. 
I, I can make a set of rules, I can make a set of expectations, but it's nothing until you show up. Y you're the person who finishes the thing that I've started. Players don't expect games to be static, sealed units. They expect games to be worlds that invite them in and then let them co-create. So you're seeing now in, in games like Minecraft and Team Fortress 2, a world where an inseparable part of the play experience for many people is making videos, making comics, making comedies out of the activities that they undertake in the game. So that's the, the palette that, that I now have as a game maker, where computers are everywhere and cheap, where we can take games out into the real world, where we can approach our players as collaborators rather than an, an audience. And the more we collaborate with storytellers to find ways to make our stories something that players can reach out and touch and, and mould for themselves, the more we break away from those traditions of, of one person, one screen. For all that we're 50 years into this evolution, I think we're at the beginning of the most interesting bit in terms of where games and story might take us next.